Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. My name is Ben, I'm going to talk to you today about health, social insurance and the role of the state. I'm aware that today is quite a long day, I think this is the sixth one of these you've sat through, but if there's just a few things I want you to take away from this, I want it to be these. I want to persuade you as budding young economists or people who just have a general interest in economics that you should care about health. Healthcare is important, healthcare is interesting, and healthcare is a huge part of what economists think about. And then I'm going to go through some of the arguments for why we think health is different and why we don't treat healthcare just like any other market. We think it's different to a market for lawnmowers, for mobile phones, for whatever it is. We think it's a special case. A lot of those arguments you'll probably be familiar with. I think about things from an economic perspective, which obviously isn't the only perspective that matters, but today it is. And then I'm going to link that to the broader role of the state in providing social insurance and insuring people against risks that they cannot easily insure themselves against. There's lots of examples. This will link to a lot of the things you've heard about earlier on today and what you hear about after me. So I'll try and link to those things as best I can, hopefully try and piece together some of the uh, things my colleagues have talked about. And then finally, I'm going to turn to an unresolved policy question and a policy debate that still rumbles on, uh, which is the question of how we should structure and fund social care. Uh, it's never too far from the headlines, it's a topic that politicians are afraid of, but we're going to talk through some of the economic arguments and link it to some of the broader ideas that I'll cover earlier in the lecture. First of all, why do economists care about health? It doesn't really feel like our domain, it feels like for something, somebody else. Why do we care? First of all, we spend a huge amount on health. It's a big part of what government does. So if we look here, this is spending by function in the UK last year, and split by different uh, parts of different parts of the state, health is a huge part of what we do. So in 2017-18, the government spent more than £140 billion in this year's prices on health. That dwarfs things like spending on defence, so all the Navy, the Army, the Air Force. Public order and safety includes all of our spending on courts, on prisons, on the police. Spending on health dwarfs those things. Social security is obviously a big part of what government does as well. But if you split out by pensioners and non-pensioners, health is the biggest thing that government does. It's a big thing that the government does, and it's been a growing part of what the government does. So the light green line here shows, as a share of national income, how much do, does the UK government spend on healthcare? And you can see it's been rising over time. It's now, it's fallen slightly since 2010, and it's still in excess of 7% of national income. The darker green line shows spending in real terms, so adjusting for inflation, and it's increased more than sevenfold since the NHS was founded about 70 years ago. And again, more than £140 billion. Pounds. So if we take that light green line and we show how much we've spent historically, we spend a lot now, but the fact is we're probably going to have to spend a lot more. So when you think about the fact that the population is ageing and elderly people tend to use more healthcare, we now have more people uh, living longer, which is something to be celebrated. We have more people surviving conditions that previously might have killed them, again, something to be celebrated. But these things mean that more people are going to be needing to use the health service. And we have a lot more people living with uh, chronic conditions and multiple chronic conditions. So you might have someone living with dementia and something like uh, diabetes. And those people can be quite expensive to treat. And then combine that with the fact that there's always new medical treatments and drugs and technologies coming along. A lot of those are expensive as well. The combination of these things means that we're probably going to have to spend a bit more on health. And the Office of Budget Responsibility, the government's fiscal watchdog, projects that uh, by 2066, 67, so when we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of England's famous World Cup win, <laughs> we'll be spending almost 7% more of national income on health than we do today. That's more than £140 billion in today's terms. It's more than £2,000 for every person in the UK. That's a lot. And you should really care about that because we are taxes as you go through your life and you pay into the system. A bigger and bigger share of that are likely to be going towards paying for these costs. And it's in your interest, in everybody's interest, that we think carefully about how that's structured, how that's paid for, and whether it's done effectively and efficiently. But this isn't specific to the UK. Those demographic pressures aren't specific to the UK. So we can compare how much we spend to some of our other um, neighbours, particularly other developed countries, and you can see that some spend more and some spend less. So the dark line here is public spending, and the lighter green line is private spending. You'll notice the US is something of an outlier, I will not going to address that at all today. Um, but you can see if you look at uh, the two lines above and below the UK, we either spend just more than the EU average or just less than the EU average, depending on whether you wait for national income. We spend more than countries like Italy, Greece and Ireland, but we spend less than Sweden and France. So we're somewhere in the middle. 
but all those countries are facing similar, if not starker, demographic pressures and will face pressures to increase health spending as well. So we spend a lot on healthcare, but let's go now a bit more narrowly. Health is an important input to human capital. So my colleague Angus earlier on talked a bit about early childhood development and the importance of uh, things like early interventions in people's development for the cognition and their other skills. But health is an important part of that. So fetal conditions, so the conditions while you're in the womb as a baby, have been shown to have substantial impacts on your outcomes later in life. This is summarised quite nicely by Armand and Curry, but I want to focus on two particular papers which I think are really interesting. So first of all, Douglas Armand found that individuals who were in utero, so when they were, they were in the mother's, they were in utero in the, uh, during the uh, influenza crisis in 1918, people who were exposed to that shock, so the mother was more likely to have caught influenza, displayed reduced e educational attainment, they had lower earnings, they were more likely to be disabled, and they had lower socioeconomic status than people who weren't. More recently, a paper showed that uh, exposure to low-dose radiation in Scandinavia from Russian uh, weapons testing has been linked to people's outcomes later in life again. So that health shock to the mother while the baby's developing in the womb has led to reduced educational attainment, earnings and cognition. So health really matters. If economists care about people's education, about their income, about their later development, we need to care about health. Health is a politically contentious issue. People really care about it. It's never far from the headlines. It's never far from the things that people say they care about. So this time last year, YouGov asked the British people, what are the most important issues facing the country right now? The, the one that was uh, said most was Brexit, but number two was health. That was admittedly during the midst of a quite a bad winter crisis, but people clearly care about this stuff. If you ever watch breakfast TV shows or the news, people can't get enough of it. It's always out there. People really care. And economists have a massive and valuable contribution to make to that debate. Ultimately, economists often care about people's welfare and their well-being. <coughs> and health is obviously going to be a part of that. You might talk in jargon about the health state dependence of the utility function. What that really means is people just enjoy stuff more when they're healthy. People are happier when they're healthy. So if you care about people's well-being and their welfare, you have to care about their health. And finally, it's complicated and that makes it interesting. And if you don't believe me, Donald Trump says it's an unbelievably complex subject and nobody knew it could be so complicated. And that gives lots of questions for us to address, lots of things for us to think about, and economists can really dig into the detail. So when we think about the way we provide healthcare, there are a number of reasons why we might not want to just leave it to the market and leave it to be treated like any other good or service. The seminal paper on this was written back in the 60s by a future Nobel Prize winner, Kenneth Arrow. It's very readable, very easy. If you Google it, it'll come up, I would recommend. But I'll go through some of the core arguments now. And at the heart of the issue are really a number of fundamental, relatively simple economic problems that many of you may well be familiar with. So if we did just leave healthcare to the market, if the government did nothing, didn't provide anything, didn't intervene, what would happen? Well, we'd expect people to try and insure themselves against the risk of becoming sick. We think people tend to be risk averse. And if there's a world where they're at risk of getting ill and being unable to work, that might affect their income and their living standards, and as a world where they stay healthy and are fine, they're probably likely to want to try and smooth consumption across those states of the world. But if they go to a private insurance market to try and obtain that insurance, would that market function well? Would it work? There are reasons to think it might run into problems. The first is what economists refer to as adverse selection, which arises because there is an asymmetry of information between what the individual knows about their health and their lifestyle and their likelihood of getting ill in the future and what the insurance company knows. So if you go to the insurer, uh, so let's say the insurance company looks at the whole population and says, here's an average fair price, at which I, ex I can expect to break even if everybody buys insurance. But if you know that you've got a family history of uh, heart disease, or you know that you smoke a lot, or you know that you live uh, particularly dangerously and likely to get ill, you're th going to think that's a great deal. If, on the other hand, you're really, really healthy and you're really unlikely to get sick, it's going to look like a terrible deal. So you might expect that only the risky or sick people will buy that insurance. And that will mean the insurer makes losses. They might respond by raising the price of insurance again. So now that only really, really sick people will buy insurance and this continues. And the outcome can be that the market breaks down entirely. And no equilibrium can support the provision of insurance. And even those people who, well, everyone would find insurance valuable, but even the very sickest and even the very healthiest people, no one can purchase insurance. 
The classic papers, uh, Akerlof talks about second-hand car market and Rothschild and Stiglitz talk about insurance, very famous papers, you may be familiar with them uh, from your uh, studies, are very worth reading as well. But the other side of that asymmetry of information problem is the problem of moral hazard. So if you're, the idea of that is that when you're insured against the risk of something, you behave differently to if you weren't insured. So we might think about that happening in a few different ways. So first of all, if you have full insurance, you might take reduced precautions against the risk of going into that adverse state in the first place. So if you know you've got full, <coughs> full health insurance, you're not going to have to pay anything if you get sick. Maybe you don't take as much care of your diet. Maybe you exercise less. Maybe you drink more alcohol, do more extreme sports, whatever it is. Then once you're in the adverse state, so let's say you get sick, you then have less incentive to try and get out of that state. So once you're in hospital, if you're fully insured and it doesn't, doesn't matter how long you stay there or what treatment you get because someone else is footing the bill, maybe you have less incentive to try and get better. And then once you're in that state, you might also incur higher costs. So if that extra scan, if that extra test, if that extra operation is paid before by someone else, you might <coughs> overconsume healthcare in that state. So to think about that more formally, generally in economics we think that consumers should keep consuming until the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. Nice and simple. But if the consumer doesn't actually pay that marginal cost themselves, if it's paid for by someone else, they effectively face a marginal cost of zero. So they'll keep consuming until the marginal benefit equals zero. When the true marginal cost is greater than zero, in the case of healthcare, it's going to be overconsumed relative to the socially optimal level. So this is one of the costs associated with moral hazard and the uh, inability to perfectly uh, make people behave as they might in a socially optimal way. There's a good discussion of this in the US context, I've been the references at the end. Another problem, a fundamental economic idea, which I think my colleague Rebecca has already talked about, is that of externalities. So in the context of health, if you are ill and you have some horrible flu and you go out to work or into the street, you can infect other people. And that is a clear negative externality on them. That's something and a cost you're imposing on them by being sick and not getting treated. We might also think that healthy workers tend to be more productive. They might be absent less often, and that's going to have benefits that spill over onto the company or to wider productivity or economic performance as a whole. And if those externalities aren't taken into account, then you might, not, might think that healthcare might not be consumed at the socially optimal level. More broadly, if we think about the conditions that need to be satisfied for a perfectly competitive market to be, uh, well, for the paradigm to be satisfied, but also for it to work well, you might want there to be a large number of buyers and sellers, but in healthcare that might not be either desirable or viable. You might not have a large number of people all independently deciding which drugs are the right ones to buy, which treatments we should be investing in. You might not, might not be feasible to have a large number of sellers. Um, you might, there might be such economies of scale that you might want l one large hospital serving an entire city rather than lots of small ones. So that might not be satisfied. We may not want free entry and exit. There are good reasons to restrict who can provide Healthcare, you might want them to be regulated. I'd at the very least want them to be qualified. So you might want to restrict who's able to enter the market and offer healthcare. And you might also want to restrict who can exit. If you have a local doctor or a hospital serving a rural area and they were just to shut down, those people might not have access to healthcare. So the government might be interested in preventing free exit as well. I've talked about some of the problems associated with asymmetric information in this case, which means that people don't have full and perfect information about both parties won't have the same information. And in the presence of externalities, private costs won't equal social costs. So really, healthcare doesn't look like it's very suited to leaving it to the private market to work everything out. And perhaps unsurprisingly, as a result, almost all OECD countries or developed countries have universal health insurance. I say almost all because the US remains something of a special case. Is that a good thing? Is that desirable? Well, we might think so, definitely, if the risks of getting sick that you're insuring people against, if that's outside of their control, if it's due to age, you can't help growing old, you can't help your genetics, you can't help being unfortunate in contracting some sort of illness or disease. But perhaps less so if you think that the risk of getting sick is affected primarily by your choices. And if by fully insuring people, you're giving them incentive to eat less well, exercise less, drink more alcohol, whatever it is. But we might think that from an economic perspective, government intervention can improve efficiency and welfare and take into account some of those positive externalities of health that we were talking about. But that will involve redistributing. It will involve redistributing from healthy people to sick people. And that's something government can do and it's a decision that societies can make, but it's one that we should acknowledge is happening. And that government intervention, so let's say the government steps in and mandates that everybody has to buy private insurance, 
that will deal with the adverse selection problem because you can only choose whether to buy or not, so everybody will enter the market and you can offer it at an average fair price. But that moral hazard problem still remains because you still can't monitor what people are doing. And if they're fully insured, you still can't make sure that they're, um, I don't know, making every effort they can to get out of hospital or behaving well beforehand to stop themselves from going in. And so, given that moral hazard problem, you might want to partially, but not completely, insure individuals against these risks. In this case, the risk of becoming sick. So the, the, what that means is, rather than cover all the costs that are born when they become ill and need healthcare uh, treatment, maybe they should pay for some of it in some form. So while all, virtually all, the OECD countries have decided to offer universal health insurance, the way that that's organised and provided and structured varies quite drastically. Um, often people like to point to cases abroad and say, well, if we just did it like that country, everything would be perfect and fine. But that ignores the reality that there are trade-offs between these different approaches. There are definite pros and cons of different ways of doing things. And a lot of these systems have evolved for a range of historical, cultural, political and societal factors that you can't just replicate overnight. But there are different approaches, different ways of doing things and different trade-offs to be made. So one of them is whether it might be publicly paid for, but it doesn't have to be publicly provided. So in the UK, the NHS has, we have publicly owned NHS hospitals, um, and they provide the majority of hospital care. In other countries, um, often it's private hospitals that provide the care, even if the state eventually pays. So in France, which is a country with uh, a much larger state than the UK in terms of overall government spending, and we don't, like don't really think of it as a state that would have lots of private involvement, Somewhere between a quarter and a third of all hospital beds are in the private sector. A lot of people get treatment in a private hospital that's ultimately paid for by the government, but it's not provided directly by the government. You might have a case where there's a single insurer. In the UK, the NHS functions as that single insurer for everybody. Or you could have a case of multiple insurers, where people can choose the package that works for them, for different premiums, different excesses, whatever it is. Or in some countries, to go back to France, you might be covered, the state will cover something like 75% of your costs, but if you're not poor or old or sick, you might have to pay for the final 25%. But what a lot of people do is buy insurance to cover that final 25%. And they top up insurance, but they have a choice of which one to buy or how much and so on. So people are left with a lot more choice. <laughs> left to their own devices, if people got sick, they'd probably want to consume almost an infinite amount of healthcare to try and get well again. And it has to be rationed in some way. You can ration it by need, by having waiting lists, or people have to be referred by the GP, for example, before they can go to hospital. Or you can ration by price. If you think people are going to try and overconsume something, you can raise the price until they're no longer doing so. I'll talk a little bit more about all that in a minute. In terms of how you pay for it, you could have insurance premiums where every month out of your pay packet you'll pay a certain percentage into a pot that will eventually be used for that for your healthcare and other people's healthcare costs. Or you can fund out of general taxation like everything else, and you pay as you go, effectively, which is what we do in the UK. And as I say, there are trade-offs between all these different things. But one thing I want to focus on is the level of out-of-pocket charges. So the extent to which people have to pay themselves for their healthcare costs. That's known as the co-payment. Uh, and that varies quite dramatically. There are lots of arguments around this um, from all sorts of perspectives. As I said, I'm going to focus on the economic perspective uh, here, which isn't the only one or even necessarily the most important one in questions like this. So if you have co-payments, so you charge people some percentage of their costs when they go to hospital or the doctor. That means they're partially but not fully insured. So maybe it costs £50, the state pays 40 you pay 10 You're partially but not fully insured. One advantage of that is the more money you raise from co-payments, the less money the government has to raise from taxes, from borrowing, from other sources which have their own uh, associated costs. And by charging people, it's an attempt to deal with the moral hazard problem. So if you bear some of the cost of going to A&E, maybe you don't go unnecessarily or you do more to try and stop yourself from ending up there. But clearly there are also downsides to charging people for healthcare. Charging people might lead them to delay treatment, so they might wait longer before they go to the hospital and during that time they might get more sick and they might end up presenting to the health system later on in a worse state and it might actually end up being more expensive to treat them as a result. And if they delay that treatment or avoid a treatment altogether, they might pass on whatever it is they've got to other people, they might be off work, they might be less productive in the workplace or at home or whatever it is. So there might be negative externalities. And of course there is, uh, in some sense, an inequity of linking access to healthcare to an ability to pay. And it's not the only approach to the moral hazard problem, charging people. You can do other things. 
So you might regulate, you might decide which treatments are cost-effective, which treatments doctors can and can't prescribe, which drugs we are pay for, which ones we won't pay for. In the UK, that's done by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which is shortened to NICE. I'm not just a big fan. Mm -hmm. And they decide what doctors can and can't do. We also have in the UK, the GPs function as gatekeepers, in a sense. So you have to go to your G GP and they judge you to be of sufficient need to refer you for certain treatments at the hospital. That rations care that way. And also, if you think people are going to overuse, let's say, accident and emergency services and you want them to use less of it, you could just tell them to. So often you'll have poster campaigns, radio campaigns, telling people if you just got a cold in the winter, don't go to hospital because you're taking up valuable space that someone else could. So that's another approach as well. These aren't just technical issues, these really do affect people's lives and their, um, their well-being. And these things vary across countries. So I'm now going to compare across a number of countries the proportion of people who skipped a doctor consultation because of cost. So you can see the light green bar now is the uh, average and the red one is the UK. So on the left hand side you can see that more than one in five people in the US skipped a doctor consultation because of how expensive it was. In uh, Spain and Germany, that was more like 2 or 3%. The UK, about 4%. It's doing better than average, but it's not the best. We can also look at the proportion of people who skipped a prescription because of the expense. Actually, sorry, we go back, sorry. Interestingly here, in the UK, we don't charge for doctor consultations. So this is, this is presumably because of the uh, cost of travel or the cost of missing work, which is just quite interesting, I thought. We do charge for prescriptions, but far fewer people in the UK are skipping a prescription due to cost than in other countries. In the UK, if you're old or if you are sick or if you are a child, you are exempt from prescription costs. So you are not sick if you're long-term disabled. So that protects a lot of people from the cost. In the US, again, you're looking at getting on to one in five people are skipping a prescription that they need because of how expensive it is. Uh, and other countries like Spain, again, performing better than average, Canada and Australia and Portugal performing slightly worse. And finally, we can look at the proportion of people who spend more than 10% of their income on out-of-pocket medical charges. 10% is quite a lot to be spending. In the UK, again, it's a very small percentage. We do quite a good job of protecting people against those risks. Those people are presumably doing it through the private uh, medical system. But on the left-hand side, you can see countries like Portugal, Greece, and Belgium, where those countries have a greater degree of charging for uh, hospital stays or doctor visits, or I think in Belgium, you charge for every night you spend in hospital unless you, are, you meet certain criteria. So those countries do a less good job of protecting people against the risk of high medical costs. But universal healthcare is just one example of the, the state stepping in to provide a safety net and provide social insurance. There are many other examples which you, we'll, uh, you've heard some about earlier today. So when I talk about social insurance, I mean government interventions to provide insurance against risks that people struggle to insure themselves against. So it's like a transfer based on an event, whether that event is growing old and qualifying for a state pension, whether that event is becoming ill and getting free health care, or whether that event is being disabled and qualifying for disability benefits. Social insurance is a large and a growing part of government expenditure. It's linked to, but distinct from, the idea of the welfare state. Other examples uh, unemployment insurance ensures you against the risk of becoming involuntarily unemployed. Tom earlier talked about uh, labour supply and responses to tax and benefits, so economists think carefully about how to design these systems. The state pension and the risk of living too long, effectively, so ensuring you against the risk of getting into your 90s and having run out of savings, the government still provides some money. David's going to talk more about pensions after me. And disability insurance. So Agnes talked about inequality earlier. And one of the things the government might be concerned about is that some people, if through no fault of their own, are unable to work and uh, obtain an income, they might have very low, or we might think unacceptably low, standards of living. So the government tries to step in and redistribute to them to help them out. So you can think about it from that perspective, or you can think about it as just ensuring people against that risk of being uh, severely disabled or becoming injured and not being able to work. So these things crop up throughout public economics. But why does it have to be social insurance? Why are these things different to other types of insurance? So when we think about insuring your car, or fire insurance, or home insurance, why is that different? When people obtain insurance, the broad motivation is to try and reduce risk. People tend to be risk averse. And they want to smooth consumption across different states of the world. So the world where your house burns down, the house where, world where your house doesn't burn down, you want to ensure your, smooth your consumption between those two states. 
But why does it have to be the government that provides this intervention? Why does it have to be social rather than private insurance? First of all, we might th worry about market failures. So I talked about asymptomatic information earlier in the context of health, but that might be true throughout a lot of these areas. So if think about unemployment insurance. If you went to a private market to try and get insurance against becoming unemployed, who might be most likely to go and buy that insurance? Probably those most likely to become unemployed, those who think their jobs are at risk or aren't working very hard, for example. Externalities crop up all over the place. Market failures can justify government intervention. You might think about paternalism and the government wanting to step in to correct what they perceive to be uh, optimization failures on individuals' behalf, whether that's being short-sighted or whether that's not understanding the system properly or making decisions the government judges not to be in their long-term interest, the government can step in. And finally, they might want to redistribute. And often we think that governments might want to compensate high-risk people because being high risk often isn't the fault of that person. So that's the case perhaps for, say, disability living benefits. One thing that crops up throughout these different instances of uh, social insurance is the problem of moral hazard. So the justification for providing uh, social insurance has a lot of common factors running through it. We think about the arguments for providing unemployment insurance or healthcare, often there's a lot of overlap. So I talked about adverse selection into unemployment insurance markets, which is used to justify that public insurance. But we also have the common problem of creating moral hazard. So in the same way, if you provide universal health insurance, you might think people overconsume health care or don't do enough to avoid becoming sick. You might be worried that with generous unemployment insurance, people have less incentive to find a job. So they have less incentive to leave the, in this case, adverse state of being unemployed. So what that does is increases the cost of providing that insurance because they stay on unemployment benefits for longer. Now, Tom talked about earlier how we structure these things differently and in the UK there's all sorts of strings attached to unemployment benefits. But the point still stands that the moral hazard problem means that the cost of providing that insurance is higher, which then has to be paid for through higher taxes or higher borrowing with the costs that can go along with those things. So that's really the trade-off at the heart of social insurance. It's that on the one hand it's desirable to allow people to smooth consumption across states of the world and ensure them against risks that they can't really protect themselves against. But on the other hand, Social insurance can create moral hazard, which increases the cost of providing that insurance in the first place. So the ultimate policy, sorry, the optimal policy might be to partially but not completely insure people against those risks. So offer insurance against the most catastrophic costs, but maybe still make people pay some share of the bill ultimately, or attach conditions to the insurance which you provide. And the key challenge for economists is working out what the optimal level is, how the system should be designed and structured and administered and making sure that we try and minimise the economic costs and maximise the economic benefits. Uh, Raz Chetty and Amy Finkelstein talk about this in a, in a really good paper. And I want to turn to what is an unsettled question. So I'm not pretending that healthcare is fully settled and we've solved it, but there's a broad consensus about how it should be structured and kind of how it, how it should be broadly run. Social care is a totally different kettle of fish. So when I talk about social care, I mean the broad range of uh, non-medical services that we provide to people who have a physical or a mental illness or disability that means they struggle with activities of daily living. So things like uh, being able to do housework, do washing, feed yourself, uh, just get around. Then you can think about instrumental activities of daily living, struggles with handling money or struggles with shopping, things like that. It can be provided informally by people's family or their friends or their neighbours. Or it can be provided on a more formal basis by uh, trained professionals, whether that's publicly funded or privately funded. In England, that publicly funded formal social care is both needs tested and means tested. So when I say needs tested, I mean you have to satisfy certain criteria. You have to judge that your needs are severe enough that you qualify. You have to struggle with a certain number of these difficulties. And even, even if they then judge that you have sufficient need, you then have to have limited financial means. And that's quite a severe means test in the UK. So if you've got assets over something like £16,000, you qualify for no state support whatsoever. And if, you, they're informal, if you're living in a care home, that includes the value of your house if no one is living in it. Um, and if you have income over a certain level, the state also doesn't provide any support. So you're expected to contribute to the costs of your social care if you are of sufficient financial means. And there's no lifetime cap on those costs. And if you have a care need uh, that spans over multiple years, that can become quite expensive. This is in stark contrast to how we provide healthcare. So whereas we have universal healthcare with free at the point of use and provided to everyone, 
That's not how we do social care. Social care, people are expected to pay, and people do pay. Back in 2011, Andrew Dilnot, who was a former director of the IFS, uh, was commissioned by the government to do a report on the future of funding for social care. And he concluded that it's not fit for purpose and it's desperately needed reform for many years. His commission was just one of many. It's been an ongoing thing where the government's come in, commission a review, they produce recommendations, the government ignores those recommendations, and then we repeat the process. We're somewhere in the middle of that at the moment. The UK government still doesn't provide universal social care. And the private long-term insurance market is extremely limited. So people struggle to get insurance through a private provider. And the result is that people are unable to protect themselves against the risk of catastrophically high care costs in old age. So Dilnot said that they, they modelled it and they reckon that one in ten people face care costs of in excess of £100,000 over their lifetime, something that they're expected to pay for themselves. But why is it that the private market is so limited? So in the absence of that social insurance, you might expect people to want to insure themselves. It's a risk that is quite random and costly, and they'd presumably find insurance valuable. But the market is limited for a number of reasons on the demand and the supply side. I'm going to talk about this quite quickly because I'm running reasonably low on time. On the demand side, you might worry about adverse selection. So in the same way with healthcare, you might worry about uh, the people who most want to buy health insurance or those who are most likely to get sick. Maybe those who are most likely to need care in old age are most likely to buy care insurance. And actually there's a paper that shows that people who have the genetic mutation for Huntington's disease are something like five or six times more likely to buy long-term care insurance. So there is evidence of these problems of adverse selection. Unlike healthcare, um, informal care can substitute for formal care. So you might not trust your child or your spouse to perform a triple heart bypass, you might trust them to come and help you do the shopping once a week. And that can impose negative externalities on those carers themselves. It might mean that they have to drop out of work or reduce their hours or just impose personal costs that might not be taken into account. We might worry about individual optimization failures where people might not understand the system and wrongly expect the government to step in and provide social care in old age. Or you might think that people are pessimistic about their need for so likely need for social care. If they think they're unlikely to survive until old age, maybe they don't bother saving for it or preparing for it. And I think David might talk about that a little bit more in a moment. On the supply side, we might again have concerns about moral hazards. So if you're an insurer, you might be worried that if you fully insure someone, maybe they have someone come to the house six times a week when they only really need them to come three times. Or maybe they go to a more expensive care home rather than the one that they could get by in. And costs might increase that way. But the bigger problem is that insurers struggle to diversify risk when it comes to long-term care. So when you think about an insurer facing the risk of having to pay out lots of money to support people into old age with their care costs, Let's say there's a new medical development that means that we're much better at treating cancer or uh, some heart, heart attack treatment that means people survive longer. Everyone in that cohort could benefit from that and everyone's probably going to live a bit longer, which means long, you're paying care costs for longer and it's going to hit your profits. So it's, it's a difficult to diversify within the cohort because that new shock, that new medical advance affects the entire cohort. But every cohort that follows would also benefit from that medical advance. That treatment's not going to go away. So you struggle to diversify across cohorts as well. And what, you lead, what you're left with is this problem of correlated risks. And it's very difficult for insurers to model this properly and they're reluctant to enter the market as a result. It's quite a complicated problem, that one, but it's a real issue that insurers frequently bring up when they're asked why don't they provide more private care insurance. So to summarise the problem, it's that people have this risk of developing a long-term care need and it's one against which they presumably find some form of insurance valuable. The state doesn't step in to provide it. The state doesn't provide social insurance. People are expected to pay often large amounts for their care. And the private insurance market is extremely limited, at least here in the UK. So people are left with this large, uninsured and poorly understood financial risk in old age. And many people come to the same conclusion that this is not a great state of affairs. It's widely acknowledged to be in need of reform and the government actually promised last year to publish a green paper, which it's delayed and kicked into the long grass again. We may get it at some point this year. We don't know. As ever, there are trade-offs to consider when, we come, when you think about these things. A more generous social care offer, might, you might have listened to all that and thought, well, why doesn't the government just provide it to everyone? Well, it wouldn't be costless. If you want to pay for extra spending, you've got to pay for that somehow. Is that taxes? Which taxes do you raise? Are they going to be distortionary? Are they going to have problem, create problems elsewhere? Do you cut other things? If so, what? Do you borrow more? Well, that has obvious costs as well. It might not be a sustainable solution forever. 
and the public finances already face considerable long-term challenges from an aging population, as I talked about earlier on. So the Office of Budget Responsibility project that with unchanged policy, given the demographic pressures and things like that that are changing over time, public sector net debt would increase from around 90% of national income today. So when we're celebrating that 100th anniversary of the World Cup win, it could be closer to 300%. And this is clearly an unsustainable path. But this is <laughs> uh, rather gloomily called the graph of doom, which says that if we keep overall spending constant, given the pressures on health, on pensions, on long-term care, if we keep the overall share of uh, national income that we spend by the public, everything else would have to fall. So other public service spending, if total spending is held constant, will have to fall and fall and eventually could reach nothing. And clearly in that scenario it's impossible to provide the same range and quality of services that we provide now. That's just not going to be an option. So we have some tough decisions to make about whether we increase taxes, whether we think about cutting back other things, or whether we do something to try and tackle some of these pressures, or all of the above. So the question really with social care is, to what extent should the government step in to provide insurance? What extent should they protect us against that risk? If you recall, we said the optimal policy might be to provide partial, not full insurance. So maybe people should have to foot the bill for some of their social care costs, but not all. But if it's some, how much? Should their house count towards their assets if you're means testing them? What about should residential care be treated differently from care in your own home? What, some things that people get upset about, the fact that if you get cancer, and you might have very expensive chemotherapy or radiotherapy treatment, it's provided free of charge by the NHS. If you get dementia and you have to live with that for 10 years with a carer coming into your home to look after you, you could end up with a bill running to six figures. So it's very difficult to uh, decide how it should be optimally structured. And as a result, it's a contentious issue. If you think back to the 2017 election, the social care debate arguably lost Theresa May her majority. and People get very angry about these things, perhaps in part because people understand how the current system works, so when someone proposes, proposes an alternative, it often gets a rather frosty response. So there may be a strong case for a greater degree of social insurance in the case of social care, but the devil will be in the detail and past experience suggests that meaningful reform may be unlikely anytime soon, however much it may be needed. So the key things I'd like to take away from today, I hope I've convinced you that economics uh, economists should care about health, it's big, it's important, it's interesting, there's lots of interesting areas, it's very policy relevant, it's in the news, and it's a big part of what academics work on as well, it publishes very well. And uh, universal health care is just one example of the government providing social insurance. We talked about unemployment insurance, we talked about disability insurance, all sorts of other things that crop up with the same arguments and the same ideas. But one area where we don't provide social insurance, people still expose to considerable risk, is social care. So keep an eye out, we might get announcements in the next few months, but if I were you, I wouldn't hold your breath. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of today.